Michelle Martinko was born on October the 6th, 1961, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to parents Albert Martinko and Janet Martinko. She was the youngest of two children, the other being her older sister Janelle. Her mum Janet had five miscarriages before Michelle came along, so when she was born, she was the miracle baby. Michelle attended Cedar Rapids Kennedy High School, where she was an above average student and well regarded by school officials. She was also a talented performer, joining the twirling squad as a sophomore and performed in choirs and theatre productions. When she finished school, she wanted to study interior design at university. Those who knew Michelle described her as kind, sweet, funny and smart. In high school, although she didn't have many close girlfriends, she started getting a lot of attention from boys. One of those boys was Andy Seidel. Michelle met Andy when she was 15 years old at a roller skating rink. He was just a year older than her and Michelle and Andy dated for two years before they broke up. It was Michelle who wanted to end the relationship. She later dated another boy, but Andy wasn't prepared for her to move on. After they broke up, he wanted to know her every move, who she was dating, why she was dating, and so on. On the evening of December the 19th, 1979, Martinko attended a banquet for the Kennedy Concert Choir at the Sheraton Inn in Cedar Rapids. She was dressed for the occasion in a black dress, black scarf, heels and a waist-length white jacket. After the event, she asked a couple of her friends to join her on a shopping trip to the Westdale Mall, which had recently opened and where she also worked, but her friends declined. Martinko then went to the mall alone carrying $180 and intending to finalise the purchase of a new winter coat. Once there, she looked around the various stores, had food with a friend in the food court, and chatted with other people she knew, including Andy, who coincidentally was actually there to look for a present for Michelle. When it came to buying the coat, she ultimately decided against the purchase, and around 9pm, she smiled and said goodbye to another friend before heading out the mall. Her car wasn't parked close to the door of the mall, so Michelle would have to walk alone in the dark for a few minutes to the quiet corner of the mall where she opted to park. The innocent young woman would not be aware of the horror that was waiting for her at her car. When Michelle didn't arrive home that night, her family started to worry. At 2am, since Martinko had still not returned, her father reported her missing. It wouldn't take long for police to locate her car. At around 4am, the police found her body in the family car, which was still in the parking lot. She was lying on the passenger side floor. She had been stabbed 29 times in her face, neck and chest. Her hands bore defensive wounds, which indicated that she had fought in vain against her killer. The cash she had been carrying was still in the car, ruling out robbery as a motive. Police determined from the lack of blood outside the car that Michelle had been killed while in the car, and the medical examiner determined the murder weapon was something sharp and pointed but he couldn't say conclusively it was a knife. The killer left no fingerprints, which led police to believe they had worn gloves. Martinko was fully dressed, and the medical examiner determined she had not been sexually assaulted, but police believe the motive may still have been a sexual one, and Michelle had fought so hard that the perpetrator may not have been able to follow through on his original plan. Police also considered the killing to be personal in nature, based on the number and location of the stab wounds. 
Police had a few leads and appealed to the public for tips. Several suspects were cleared of suspicion, including a juvenile found carrying a knife and a shopping centre employee who had told police he enjoyed following women. Rumours circulated that Martinko had received harassing phone calls before her death, but police found nothing to substantiate this. Forensic testing of the car did offer a bit of hope. Police obtained blood scraping from the inside of the car on the gear shift, and a spot of blood was found on Michelle's black dress. DNA, however, in 1979 wasn't as advanced as it is now, so for now it was unclear whether this would assist in finding Michelle's killer. Even though Michelle was seen by multiple people inside the mall, no witnesses came forward to say that they saw her inside her car or that they saw someone approach her. One of the first people to be questioned by police was Michelle's ex-boyfriend Andy. Friends told police that he wanted to know her every move and when the police discovered Andy met Michelle at the mall, they wanted answers from him. Andy told them that he went home shortly afterwards and his mother provided him an alibi confirming that he was home that night and had returned shortly after the mall closed. Andy told police that despite what people thought, he was on good terms with Michelle and they had just grown apart. Many people, including Michelle's family and friends, expected Andy to be charged. But with no hard evidence against him, police couldn't take things any further, and he left Cedar Rapids shortly after and joined the Navy. It was a blow to her family, who like many others believed that he was responsible for Michelle's murder and wondered if there would ever be enough evidence to charge and convict him. Michelle's parents, Janet and Albert, died in the 1990s, believing that Andy had killed their daughter and gotten away with it. In 2005, over 25 years since her murder, Detective Doug Larrison, who had gone to school with Michelle, reopened the cold case. As he sifted through the case files the original investigators had put together, he saw that a blood sample that had been taken from the car's gear stick and sent off for testing had never been followed up. The detective obtained the results and discovered that the gear shift had male DNA on it. The spot of blood on Michelle's dress had a full male DNA profile that was consistent with the male DNA profiled on the gear shift. The blood sample was entered into CODIS, but there was no match. The person he wanted to test though was the prime suspect, the ex-boyfriend Andy. Eventually he convinced Andy to provide a DNA sample. It did not match. After 25 years of people viewing him as the guilty party, Andy was fully cleared. He had nothing to do with Michelle's murder. But investigators were once again back to square one, and the case would go cold again for over 10 more years. By 2017, a new detective was working the case, but it was another case that would break this one wide open that of the Golden State Killer. He was charged with murder in cold cases based on the use of genetic genealogy. This involves the charting of DNA from one family member to another. It creates a DNA family tree. The sample was entered into a public database called GED Match. This database allows people to submit their own DNA to trace their family trees and this time they got a match to a woman called Brandy Jennings and she lived in Vancouver, Washington. They determined that she was a distant relative, a second cousin twice removed, 
to the male whose DNA was found on the dress and the gear shift. Little did she know when she entered her DNA to trace her family tree, she would actually end up solving a 38-year-old murder case. After further investigations, the search was narrowed down to three brothers who lived in Iowa. Their names were Kenneth Burns, Donald Burns and Jerry Burns. In October 2018, police obtained their DNA via trash they had disregarded without alerting them to the fact they were investigating Michelle's murder. All three DNA samples were sent off to be tested to see if any were a match to the DNA profile they had on file. One came back. Jerry Burns was an exact match. He was 25 years old at the time of Michelle's murder. Burns was a successful businessman who was married with children and living in Manchester, Iowa. There was no connection between him and Michelle and he had no criminal record. When police questioned him, he told them that he had nothing to do with Michelle's death. When asked if he had ever been to the mall, he confirmed he had, but could not recall when. He was arrested and charged with first degree murder on the 39th anniversary of Michelle's murder. Jerry's trial took place in February 2020. He pleaded not guilty. The prosecution's case centred mainly and almost exclusively around the DNA that was found on the gear shift and on Michelle's dress. It was the defence's case that Jerry was innocent and they told the jury that DNA evidence isn't foolproof. The jury didn't agree. It took them just three hours to find Burns guilty. His family sat quietly in court as the verdict was read.